Well, God bless you, brothers and sisters. It's a real honor to be here and uh, share uh, some of probably my favorite book in the Bible, Philippians, with you. It's a book that's been uh, very meaningful to me personally, and that'll come out a little bit later in the, in the talk. But you'll notice the title of the message is Suffering for a Purpose. And for most people who think about uh, you, college-age young men and women, the idea of suffering in the same sentence with uh, college-aged uh, young people is kind of an anomaly. I mean, after all, you, uh, you folks are at the prime of life physically. You're, uh, you're not supposed to suffer physically. Uh, old dudes like me are supposed to start to fall apart one piece at a time, but you're supposed to be at the prime of life. And what about emotionally? Well, there's every reason, or so it might appear, for incredible optimism and emotional hope in the life of a 18, a 20-year-old who's got all these wonderful opportunities of life and hope of, ahead of you. But uh, I've been around the block long enough as a, as a college pastor for many years, as a college professor, as the father of two college students, and as uh, somebody who struggled during my college years as well to know that it is certainly the case that young people sometimes suffer, and they sometimes suffer uh, severely. Let me just walk you through a single year in the life of a Biola professor, and I'm sure this could be repeated by other professors and, uh, and students as well. Uh, several years ago, I was teaching undergraduate second year Greek, and I had a young lady, a very bright young lady, very attractive young lady, who one would think has the whole, you know, kind of the world by the tail, and uh, she had to drop my class, and I think some others as well, because she was clinically depressed and couldn't face life and school anymore that semester. That same semester, in one of my grad Greek classes, there was a young lady who was on Talbot AS, and I had her in my office in tears because physically she was suffering so much she could barely uh, come to the plate and make class and get her homework done. She had followed Jesus' call to go on a short-term mission a year or two before and had contracted malaria. And this malaria was just dogging her with wave after wave of, of uh, just utter exhaustion and physical pain. She was racked with pain and, and, and trying to struggle through seminary in the face of this physical uh, adversity. During this time, I had a TA who was a Biola grad and a Talbot student. And you would think that, boy, this guy was, uh, I mean, his whole future ahead, he was engaged to be married to a wonderful young lady, and he was going through seminary, being trained for the ministry. And in the midst of this, his relational universe collapsed under him when he discovered that his parents, who had been married for more than 20 years, decided they didn't like each other anymore and were going to get a divorce. And I remember uh, praying with this young man and counseling with him as, 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 as he took on a role he should never have had to take on of being kind of a spiritual advisor to his parents as they were determined to break up uh, their marriage of 20-some years. And then my own daughters. I've got uh, one daughter who's a graduate of Biola, another one who is somewhere in this room who is a vocal performance major, a Tory student, and uh, loves every minute of it. My oldest daughter, she was chapel board chair while she was a senior and involved in AS for her last two years. And her last two years at Biola, Rebecca's last two years in Biola, she absolutely thrived. Emotionally, relationally, things were going great for Rebecca Hellerman. But her first two years at Biola, I, I can only describe as, as, as kind of an emotional uh, hell. Uh, she was facing issues of anxiety and self-doubt, and I had, it was a good thing I was on campus because I had her in my office praying with her and pumping her up and weeping with her uh, hour after hour during those first two years. And we saw God faithfully bring her through that dark time to a wonderfully bright time afterwards, but that was a tough, tough time for a college student who was very, very close to my heart. And then my own pilgrimage, as I think back to some things I really want to forget about today. Uh, between the ages of 18 and, oh, 23, I was engaged and dumped twice by two different young ladies. Talk about relational and emotional pain. And then, uh, then when I was a senior in college and I wanted to be a rock and roll star, I was a music major at Cal State Dominguez about a semester away from graduation. My emotional life caved in, and I was beset by something that psychologists call an anxiety reaction. 
I had to drop out of school, it got so bad, start seeing a psychiatrist who got me all pumped up on Valiums to cover the symptoms while I tried to sort out the root causes, uh, for which I was very grateful at the time. But I dropped out of school and wasn't able to return to college for a year, year and a half later. So I am not under the illusion for a minute that college people don't sometimes suffer deeply. In fact, in a uh, group of collegians this size, there are certainly uh, numbers of you who perhaps in quiet desperation, even alone, are enduring things that are just, uh, uh, just putting you on the edge spiritually, uh, physically perhaps, uh, relationally, emotionally. And, uh, and, and I think we have uh, something to say about that this morning. I won't pretend this morning to plumb the depths of any kind of theology of suffering or anything like that, but we come to a passage in Philippians that really reminds us that if we make Jesus and his priorities the center of our life, that God redeems suffering, that there's a purpose for suffering. Whereas if our relationship with Jesus is peripheral, he's our, kind of our personal savior who's tacked onto our life as some kind of a post-mortem fire insurance, and in my life instead is just focused on my goals, my desires, my agenda, you know, my career and all this, then suffering is gonna be pretty meaningless. All it's gonna be is an obstacle in my path. Paul was one uh, for whom Jesus was at the center of his life. And so here's a guy who right in the midst of heartache could rejoice, and that's an amazing thing. And let's uh, spend a little bit of time looking at that. Philippians 1, starting with verse 12, I'll read a few verses, and then you've got an outline if that kind of thing interests you to fill in the blanks. Maybe one or two of you will fall asleep, and that will keep you awake. And so uh, use it as you see fit. But Philippians 1, the holy text of Scripture, Paul writes, Now I want you to know, brothers, that what has happened to me has really served to advance the gospel. As a result, it has become clearer throughout the whole palace guard and to everyone else that I am in chains for Christ. Because of my chains, my suffering, most of the brothers in the Lord have been encouraged to speak the word of God more courageously and fearlessly. It's true that some preach Christ out of envy and rivalry, but others out of goodwill. The latter do so out of love, knowing that I am put here for the defense of the gospel, the former, preach Christ out of selfish ambition, not sincerely, supposing they can stir up trouble for me while I am in chains. But what does it matter? The important thing is that in every way, whether from false motives or true, Christ is preached, and because of this I rejoice. Paul's dilemma could be summarized in two simple things. One is problem people, the other is problem circumstances. Think about that. I mean, if Sometimes I think, if I could just get rid of all the problem people and problem circumstances in my life, well, you know what I would be? I'd be dead, because that's the only time that's going to happen, all right? And for Paul, it was pretty intense. Problem people, there are people trying to stir up trouble for him and his chains. Problem circumstances, this little simple aside, while I'm in chains, just says volumes about the fact that Paul was in a Roman prison, that God's will that had been uh, supernaturally revealed to him was brought to a screeching halt, apparently, as this apostle of the Gentiles was thrown into a Roman prison. And in the midst of all this, somehow Paul can rejoice and encourage the Philippians to rejoice. And I find this remarkable. Here in this little letter, the word translated rejoice or joy, this Greek root, is used 14 times in four short chapters. Paul somehow found the center, found contentment, found meaning, purpose, in the midst of of horrendous suffering. And there are some lessons we can learn from Paul in this regard. The first one is this, and I'm gonna really camp on this one for a few minutes here. Paul knew God would use his suffering for the benefit of others. Paul knew God would use his suffering for the benefit of others. Elsewhere, Paul writes, blessed be the God of all comfort. This is his theology of suffering, so to speak. The God of all comfort, he writes, who comforts us in our every affliction so that we might be able to comfort others who are in any affliction with the comfort with which we've been comforted by God. Now, that's a mouthful, but I would encourage you to memorize that verse because if you're not suffering today, you will someday before the Lord comes to take us home. And that verse assures me that God never wastes a hurt and that God uses the heartache and suffering in my life to touch and influence my fellow human beings on this planet for good. And that turns us from looking within in this little narcissistic, navel-gazing approach to Christianity and our Western individualistic culture that says it's all about me, and it reminds us that even in the midst of suffering, 
It's all about us, and God can use my suffering in a redemptive way. Now, in Paul's particular situation in, Phil- in prison in Rome, he gets to see his theology of suffering, that God uses suffering for the benefit of others in action in his own life. And he, he, he's, he's writing to the Philippians who are utterly convinced that because Paul's in prison, the gospel's been hindered. And he says, no, 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 because of my imprisonment, the majority of the Christians here in Rome are even more bold and courageous in their proclamation of the gospel. And that, I would submit to us today, is totally counterintuitive. I mean, logically think about it. If physical persecution of Christians broke out in America today, the logical thing to think is that Christians would, uh, you know, get on the DL down low and be very timid about vocalizing their faith we would withdraw from the public arena rather than become more courageous and more bold as we saw our brothers and sisters be persecuted for their faith. But this mysterious dynamic of the divine economy, so to speak, is in operation here in Rome where Christians who see other Christians suffer are not uh, uh, scared away but rather emboldened to proclaim Christ all the more courageously. This mysterious dynamic of the divine economy, as I've referred to it, can be observed elsewhere in church history. And I have a, uh, it'll come up on the overhead here in a minute, a, a letter that was written around 180 AD from some persecuted Christians in Gaul to, would be modern day France, to their brothers and sisters over in Asia Minor. This letter's been preserved in Eusebius as a church history. And uh, I'll just narrate this as I go through here, but basically what's happening is Christians who had denied the faith and are now watching those who had remained faithful to Christ die for their faith are inspired to confess Christ themselves. It's remarkable what happens. The person who's writing this letter, one of the suffering Christians in Asia or in uh, Gaul, and by the way, if you want a historical context for this, if you've ever seen the movie Gladiator, that was set during the uh, reign of Marcus Aurelius, and he's the emperor here at the time this is going on. But this fellow writes, he says, but the intervening time of public torture was not idle or fruitless for the martyrs, but through their endurance was manifested the immeasurable mercy of Christ. For through the living, he's talking about the spiritually alive, the martyrs, the spiritually dead were being quickened, and martyrs gave grace to those who had denied. For through the martyrs, the majority of those who had denied the faith were again brought to birth and again conceived and quickened again and learned to confess Christ and now alive and vigorous, made happy by God who wills not the death of the sinner but is kind toward repentance. They went to the judgment seat in order that they might again be interrogated by the governor. For Caesar had written that they should be tortured to death but that if any should recant, they should be let go. The governor accordingly examined them again, beheaded all who appeared to possess Roman citizenship and sent the rest to the beast to be torn limb by limb. And then this last sentence, it just slays me every time I read it. And Christ was greatly glorified by those who had formerly denied, but then confessed contrary to the expectation of the people. The expectation of the Philippians was that Paul's imprisonment would basically put an end to the expansion of the gospel in Rome. Paul says, no way. In God's mysterious divine economy, the majority of the Christians in Rome have been more emboldened to preach the gospel because of my chains. So how did Paul's suffering benefit others? Well, number one, because of Paul's imprisonment, hundreds in the Roman church preached about Christ. Hundreds preached about Christ. I don't have time to defend those statistics, but we'll move along and assume that if hundreds in Rome are encouraged to preach about Christ boldly, then if they each only preached to ten people apiece, that would mean that because of Paul's imprisonment, thousands heard about Christ. Thousands heard about And you can imagine Paul's encouragement as he's seeing his own theology of suffering, that God uses suffering to benefit others, come to a reality in his own personal suffering there in that Roman prison cell. But then, you know, Paul saw through a glass darkly like we do. He didn't get the half of it. What Paul didn't see that just utterly amazes me as I think about his imprisonment in 60, 62 AD in Rome is the third point on your outline. Because of Paul's imprisonment, millions read about Christ. 
millions read about Christ. Talk about using suffering for the benefit of others. Here we are at Biola, our spiritual emphasis week, kicking off our year with this wonderful little letter from Paul to the Philippians, a letter that we would not even have except for the historical contingency of Paul's suffering by being imprisoned in Rome back in 60, 62 A.D., I find that remarkable. And you begin to think of the prison epistles and the effect they've had on men and women and boys and girls for centuries now. And boy, you see God's economy of using suffering to benefit others and living color. And this really hits home to this kid here because I shared when I began about my uh, emotional breakdown as a senior in college. What that did is it launched me on a year-long spiritual quest. I started looking through Eastern religion and then explored Judaism and finally came to Christ in December of 1975, reading the Gospel of Matthew down on the beach in my hometown in Hermosa Beach. My conversion did not solve my emotional chaos immediately. And I remember I was uh, attending this conservative Baptist church down there in the beach area, and after I'd been a Christian a couple of year, uh, a couple of years, a couple of weeks, I kind of worked up the courage to make an appointment with this austere Baptist minister I heard preaching every Sunday named Barney Andrews. And I went into Pastor Andrews' office, you know, kind of scared but kind of excited, and I shared with Pastor Andrews that, you know, I found Jesus or he found me and I was in love with Jesus. But I also shared with him that I was emotionally a basket case, and I didn't know what to do. Pastor Andrews opened his Bible, and he took me to this little book of Philippians, chapter 4, verses 6 through 7, where Paul challenges his readers, be anxious for nothing, but in everything with thanksgiving, through prayer and supplication, let your requests be made known to God. And the peace of God which surpasses all comprehension, will guard your minds and hearts in Christ Jesus. I took those verses out of that pastor's office, and for the next year, year and a half, while I was slowly learning to trust in Christ for my emotional sanity, those little verses in Philippians where I, I picture them, I like these visual images, they were like an iron thread connecting me to God and keeping my feet on the ground emotionally. All because 2,000 years ago, a brother in Christ named Paul of Tarsus, suffered by being thrown in a Roman prison cell. It just blows me away that because of Paul's imprisonment, millions continue to read about Christ, and I am one of those. You are among those here today as we study the book of Philippians. Now, what really makes this work, and I'll uh, wrap this up quickly with the last couple observations, is that Paul shared God's priorities for what really matters in life. Paul shared God's priorities for what really matters in life. Now, I alluded to this a little bit earlier, and what I, mean, what I mean here is this, that unless you're with God's program, unless your central passion is God's passion of spreading kingdom good and influencing this world for Jesus and sharing with others the good news of Jesus in deed and word, unless that is what consumes you and you share God's priorities for life on this planet, you're not going to experience the kind of joy and hope and promise that God will redeem and, and, and create meaning through suffering that Paul experienced in his suffering. Again, if it's all about me and my agenda and Jesus is tacked on as kind of a, an afterthought, my eternal fire insurance, so to speak, then what happens when there are roadblocks in front of my life, whether in my own case when I was in my doctoral program, falling on the breakwater in Redondo while I was fishing and breaking my hip. I mean, we all have our obstacles that seem to come in our way. If life's just all about me, those obstacles are going to be meaningless uh, uh, roadblocks in the way of our agendas. But again, if our worldview is Paul's worldview, is Jesus' worldview, is your Bible's worldview, is God's worldview, then all of a sudden there's the potential uh, that suffering can have great meaning and purpose in our lives. Finally, and I hope this will be an encouragement to some of you today who are among us who are wondering when will this dark moment that I'm involved in in my life right now ever end. We see here the promise that Paul knew God would someday deliver him from his suffering. 
Paul knew God would someday deliver him from his suffering, that suffering is not uh, a permanent life sentence. Paul says, yes, and I will continue to rejoice, for I know that through your prayers and the help given by the Spirit of Jesus Christ, what has happened to me will turn out for my deliverance. I eagerly expect and hope that I will in no way be ashamed, but will have sufficient courage so that now as always Christ will be exalted in my body, whether by life or by death. Now I want to close by reflecting on an aspect of Paul's theology of suffering that is not right in our text in chapter 1, but is certainly alluded to in Philippians chapter 2. Theologians like to refer to Paul's worldview as a cruciform way of life. Now, what they mean by that is that Paul viewed every aspect of his life through the lens of the cross of Christ and what happened there at Calvary uh, some decades before Paul's uh, ministry as the apostle to the Gentiles. The other uh, few weeks ago, I finished preaching at church, and I had this lady come up, and she asked me, she says, why do good people suffer? Why do good, what a question for a pastor to get at the end of a sermon. I wanted to go home and eat lunch. Uh, why do good people suffer? And I told her this, this woman, I said, you know, I can't answer why good people suffer. I, don't, I can't answer the why question, but I, I can answer the who question. When I'm in the midst of suffering, when you're in the midst of suffering, we can be confident that we have a God who redeems suffering. That's how he works. I like to put it like this, that our God is in the business of turning garbage into glory, okay? Maybe that'll be an image you can hang on to. And what I mean is this, if you look at the cross of Christ, what you see there is the greatest injustice ever perpetrated against another human being on this planet. We hung the perfect God-man on a Roman cross. That is the greatest injustice ever experienced by anyone in world history. When we look at the cross, the cross of Christ, we also see the greatest suffering ever experienced by any human being in world history. And I'm not talking about Jesus' physical suffering. Frankly, there were hundreds, probably thousands of people who suffered physically more when they were crucified than Jesus did in the ancient world because they hung on the cross longer and died a slower death. What I'm talking about when I say Jesus suffered more profoundly, more severely than anyone in human history, I'm talking about the spiritual relational suffering Jesus experienced when the cup of God's wrath was poured on him for you and me. You know, the amazing thing is I look back at the cross today where I see the greatest act of injustice, the greatest suffering that ever happened on this planet, the darkest moment in world history, and it is that very moment that God uses to create the greatest good the world has ever experienced, your salvation and mine, our eternal relationship with the God who has created us. The cross, when I look at the cross, I am convinced again and again and again that I worship and serve and suffer with a God who is in the business of turning garbage into glory. That's just how he works. Paul knew that, and you and I need to know that too. Let's pray. Lord, we don't pretend to understand why, but we certainly know who. And we thank you so much, Lord, that you are not a God who remained distant, who peered over heaven and wrung your hands as you watched your kids suffer, but you became one of us and suffered with us and for us in ways we will never, ever know. And Lord, as we uh, worship and leave to go back to class, we just pray, Lord, that you might impress that truth deep, deep in our hearts and in our spirits so that, Lord, when we suffer, we might suffer, Lord, painfully so indeed, but we might suffer with the confidence that you will use our suffering for the good of others and for your glory for all eternity. Thank you, Lord Jesus. Amen.